So, uh, I want to welcome you all. My name is Rich Higgison. I am one of the assistant training directors here at the Guild. And I want to remind you when we get to question and answers, if you have a question, please signal me and I'll bring over a microphone to you, or there's one over there with Dwayne. Um, we are recording this session. While it's not live, I am, we may be able to hear your question. If you don't talk in the microphone, we won't hear it on the recording. So, um, Anyway, without any further ado, I'm really excited about this particular session. This session is, a, is something that should be near and dear to all of our hearts, unless we're a hand tool woodworker. Um, if we do any machinery, then knowing something about motors is something we're, that will be very, very helpful. And so, without any further ado, I will turn this over to Chuck Saunders. Hi. So that's not a duck. No. Um, well, like I said, every, most everything except for hand tools needs a motor. And we've come up with lots of different kinds. We, uh, until recently in the cordless world, everything that most of your non-stationary machinery ran with just what they call a universal motor. Um, this is out of a router that no longer turns. And the way it will work, if you remember your old science class where you had the two magnet, had the magnet and if you rotate a, a wire in a magnet it generates an electric field. You have a generator. Likewise, if you feed electricity through that wire in the magnetic field, it will turn till the poles align. You have a motor. If you keep switching the poles of that magnet, the wire keeps turning. Now you have a motor. So what they would do is you have, this may look very similar to a couple of magnets, and because we're running a current through them, they become magnets. Inside we have our loop of wire, but instead of having just one loop, we've added 700. And that allows us more power. Problem, how do we get the power into this inner core because it's spinning around and after a while the wire would just wind up and stop working. So they've put little copper bars called a commutator, and then they have brushes that are electrically conductive, and they will make contact, and as it turns and moves from bar to bar, it changes the field and makes your motor run. Generally, first thing to go bad on your motor is those brushes wear out. If you've ever looked through the little vent, when you're using your drill and you're seeing those sparks, that's the arcing between the brushes as they're going from coil to coil. Over time, they wear out. Usually your drill or whatever will be working fine and then it maybe won't always start and turn it a little bit and it will and then finally it just doesn't work at all. At that point, <clears throat> usually just replacing the brushes and you're, you're back in shape. Everything's fine. Unfortunately, on these motors, about all that you can do to repair, cord goes bad, you can replace the cord. The brushes go bad, you can replace the brushes. Bearings go bad, you can replace the bearings. Anything past that, you reach a point where, as, the, uh, as you found out later in the cordless world, where your battery went bad, and you went down to buy a new battery, and they said, Battery's $100, and you said, well, the, the whole drill is $100, and comes with a battery, and they said, you asked for a battery. Um, but usually what happens after that is you'll burn up the armature, that costs more than the tool, because now you're paying replacement part price. And so you reach a point where it's not worth fixing. Um, you can go a while until they get fancier and then they add speed controls and 
then you find that the speed control part costs more than the armature and you can fry them a lot easier. But then we moved on to battery tools with our batteries. Here's a nice one. And your motor is right here, nice little motor. The rest of it's gearbox. And it's almost unrepairable. And what usually goes wrong are the electronics. You can get the electronic board if you can get it out. And it costs about what the drill costs. So unless you have something made for you, by Fest tool, autographed with your name in the case. <laughs> um, we're a disposable economy now, and they're not worth fixing. Unless you have old ones, you can keep them and trade out parts. Um, don't have as much trouble with batteries now. The lithium ion batteries don't have problems that the old uh, NICAD batteries had of if you start charging them halfway, you know, halfway into the charge, they start taking on, that's the new full, until finally you get a battery that, straight off the charger, I'm good to go. And you go, oh, crap, how much is the new battery? And they go, why don't you just buy a new drill? And you're back in there. The, the NICADs don't have that problem. They do have a limited number of charges. So it is better to run them down, not to dead dead, but to low instead of just after every step put them on the charger because eventually you will reach the number of charge cycles the battery is going to accept and then it just doesn't charge anymore. As far as hand power tools, that's pretty much the way they all work. Um, on the old universal motor, the routers and drills with brushes, they control their speed with a resistor and if you ever bought the fancy speed control box for your router the um, Rockler and Woodcraft cell and everyone else that's just a little auto transformer resistor and you can turn down the voltage and the motor runs slower. Problem when you run slower is there are other things that are were designed expecting the motor run at the, to run at full speed and one of them is anything they put in for cooling. Most of them have little fans inside. And this one, you can see it has little fans. It has a few blades missing, which I'm sure has something to do with why it won't turn. But it's to keep air moving through and cool off the motor. When you run slower, you move less air, but you're actually putting more strain on the motor and building more heat. Heat is what kills. Once they get too hot, you melt things that are keeping the wires insulated from each other and they're no longer insulated and out comes the magic smoke, which everyone knows is the symbol for, I hope there's a sale. Um, that's, you know, like I said, there's most of them, it's, you can replace the bearings if it starts Maybe not turning quite this hard, but if you start hearing grinding and rumbling, you can replace the bearing to help. If it's arcing a lot, you can replace the brushes. When it gets past that, if, unless the, if there's a short in the cord, the tool is pretty well shot. Um, you can get parts. If you drop and break stuff, you can get most, most of the Manufacturers aren't doing much of a job of providing parts anymore. Uh, DeWalt used to have a really nice service center up off, what, 92nd? And until the day I went in to get brushes and they had one. The brushes are in pairs, so I don't know how you get down to one. And then they just don't have them. And when are you going to get parts? Well, I can order it. Well, I can order it. There are companies out there, e-replacement parts is as good as any to start out with. At least you can get the part number from They will, you put in the part, the, the tool model number, and they'll come up and have all the drawings 
You can find the parts. They either are or are not available. You can order them, they'll mail them to you. But the manufacturers have really gotten away from Powermatic. If the tool isn't brand new, they are not keeping a back stock of parts. Um, E-replacement parts tends to have them though, so there is an avenue. About the only one who really keeps a good inventory is Grizzly. And they're in Springfield, and that's their, that's their parts warehouse for the country, so we benefit, it's close. Well, that's the Universal Motors and the cordless motors. Now we move on to heavier machines. Uh, radial arm saws, joiners, table saws, mortisers. And they're going to generally be an induction motor. They, uh, this one comes apart. So this is an induction motor. You'll notice it doesn't have the commutator. There is no physical connection between the wires on the outside and the armature on the inside or stator and it's just inducing a field that's causing this to turn and so we don't have those moving parts it's nice they don't uh, don't have brushes that wear out they don't have the problem of too much current running through the brushes and smoking them uh, you can see they do have a cooling fan and the, this, is a, this is a single phase motor which means that it's running on 110 or 220 um, power you have at home whether it's the wall plug or your dryer plug or and unfortunately the way electricity is working. Single phase, if you remember, sine wave, here, here's power. At any point on that time you say, here's power, it just sits there like a transformer, goes, yeah, so? There's nothing that makes it turn. And that's why they all have these capacitors hanging off of them or in your air conditioner unit it's in the case but and so this capacitor is the start capacitor and there's a small winding inside which you can't see because of course the field is just a big mass of wire but inside there's a smaller field and it's set off a few degrees. And so when you turn it on, you now have the main field of the, bat of the main power of the field saying, I'd push if I knew which way to push. And a little small field that's offset just a little says, I'm pushing too. And it causes it to turn. Once it starts turning, it builds up speed until it gets to a point where it says, I don't need that starter anymore because now I'm going. Now the rotating field is keeping the motor turning. And that's what this unit does. Part of it. When this comes up to speed, it's weighted, it's a centrifugal switch, and eventually it pulls out and disconnects that, that lighter start field inside the, the cord. Um, and then you, and you'll hear this, usually not starting up, but you'll hear it when you turn off the motor. It'll, it'll be slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. Then you'll hear a click, and then a, usually click and a, and that's this. You're finally hearing this disengage, and there's no power, so it's still slowing down, ready for the next time. Where you can run into problem is if either the centrifugal weights 
don't spread out and collapse because they've gotten clogged with chips or squirrels or whatever gets in. Then it keeps running current through that very fine starting field, which was only meant to be on for three or four seconds after five, six minutes, it tends to burn up and it doesn't come out. Um, these motors, again, the parts available are bearings. You can buy these switch. There's a switch that's back in the back. You can buy that switch. You can buy this. Once you get into buying the bigger parts, small, these are all small motors, unless they're specialty, it's, it's not cost effective. It's cheaper to buy a new motor than to order parts. Um, you'll also see some that have a run capacitor, they'll have a start and a run capacitor, which there's just two of them. One is getting it going and the other one keeps it running happily at run speed. Uh, they're replaceable. You, you can test capacitors, but no one's ever come up with a great, I mean, you can, you can test them with a meter as long as you show it. And it's better with an analog meter, so if you can see the needle going up, you can go, yep, it's building a charge. Or, no, it's not building a charge. If it's building a charge, well, it should be good. Well, that's 50% of the time, yeah. The other 50% of the time, there's another problem with the capacitor that's not helping you. Now that's, but all, all single phase motors need that assistance. Then we get to the more preferred motor by everyone, if you have three phase power. And that's a three-phase motor. And a three-phase motor has, you'll see it has no extra um, capacitors hanging off of it. If you do take motors apart and you plan to put them back together, which none of these are going back together, these are all going to scrap after this. Always mark the end bells and the body with a, preferably with like a punch because the magic marker will come off. And if they can go on four different ways, the alignment may only work one way and you put it together in another orientation and the shaft won't turn. And it's, it's a pain. Um, let's see. I need a hammer. Some different uh, motor body types. There's one called a uh, open frame, and you'll, you'll see this on blowers and your uh, furnace at home. Then there's one called open drip, open drip proof. And they're basically designed, they have, they have vents to let the air come in directly, cool the inside of the motor. They're designed more for cleaner areas, and if they did get wet, anything that got on them should drip off and not get sucked into the motor. Uh, the other type is totally enclosed fan-cooled, TEFC, and the motor is completely encased. And then there's a fan on the outside sits on there. And then the end bell 
cover and it brings air in and blows it along the outside of the motor and that keeps the motor cool. If, however, the motor's not turning, it doesn't keep it cool. And this motor died because it got very warm and roasted itself until it wouldn't turn around anymore. So we have the end bell, loose bearings. Don't do that on shafts, you want to put something back on. Because even if you're perfect, you'll swell the ends of the shaft. If you have a file, file it back down. But so again, we have the stator. We have the field, or charcoal grill, as this one has become. And that's it. There is no start capacitors. There is no other stuff. And that's because with three phase, you have not the one sine wave you have each phase is doing the sine wave they're 120 degrees out of phase with each other and so they provide their own push to get it going it also provides a more steady flow to the motor so the motor tends to turn more smoothly um, the only problem is unlike here at home you can, for all of us who are living in regular residential areas, you can't get three phase to your house. And, and that's too bad because it's, it's a much better deal. And when you see the uh, industrial equipment go for sale and you go, oh, that's, that's a bargain except I can't run it at home because I don't have the three-phase power. And if you call Evergy, they will tell you that's not going to happen. If you live in a nearby place, they might say you might really want to reconsider this um, because it's going to take more money than you ever thought possible. And that's before we start billing you. Um, but there are ways around that. But as you can see, it's a much simpler motor. It has fewer parts, fewer things go wrong with the motor. That gets us into the auxiliary parts. Most motors, smaller motors, will have a red button on them somewhere. And that is a thermal overload. So that when the motor does get too hot, It'll say, I'm stopping now. I'm going to, let's cool off. And so even if you trip it and immediately go back and say, well, my bad, hit the button, it may or may not start up because it hasn't cooled down to the point where it says, yeah, I'm okay now. So that's, that's one safety feature. They won't always be on the motor. Saw stop, said, well, our motors are way up inside the table saw, and that's kind of inconvenient. So we'll place this switch around on the back side of the switch box, where you only see it if you're laying down, looking up at the saw, going, why won't it start? Oh, there's a button. Um, a lot of machines that have the external control box, like the, the planer, as, as a magnetic starter, they will have the uh, thermal overload inside the switch box. And so you take the cover off, push the button, and things are good. Um, let's see, what else do we... Then we get to how we turn them on. 
And so with our um, single phase motors, we can use just a motor rated toggle switch. Do not use light switches. And I, will say, I won't tell you they won't work. I will tell you don't use them. But you're just hitting one wire. So have power. And a motor rated toggle switch will do that. If, however, the power goes out, and you say, oh, well, the lights are still on. Must have tripped the breaker. And you go back to wherever your breaker box is, or you wait until Evergy puts the power back on. That tool is still on, because that toggle switch doesn't reset itself. It, it's on. And so when it does get power again, it's going to start back up. Hopefully, that's not when you're going, I mean, did something get stuck in there? What? And then they start calling you Stumpy, and you lose your membership in the Ten Finger Club, and bad stuff. Um, the other method you can use is a magnetic starter, and it has a little electromagnet that when you hit on, it pulls the contact in, and if the power disconnects or you hit stop, it disconnects power to the little coil and the switch opens. So then if you shut off because of the breaker or the power pole exploding or whatever, when it comes back on, your tool is not coming back on until you hit start. You can go with either one. Um, mag magnetic's a little stiffer, but lots of them have just mechanical switches, push button toggles, same thing. Three phase, you can't do that. Because remember I told you those, those three phases are what's giving it the push to go. They have to give it all at once, because that's what's setting, setting the direction and ready to go. And so there you have to use a magnetic contactor that will pull all three conductors in at the same time. So it will take off and go the way you want. Um, as far as reversing most, uh, if they give you the wires, yeah, there will be some motors that you open up to, and there will be three wires on the motor side and three terminals on the other side where the cord goes. Nothing you can do there. It, that's because it's AC, alternating current, switching the wires does nothing. If you have all the wires, they will usually have a diagram that will show you Swatch, swip, swatch the, switch these wires around and it'll turn the other way. Three phase motors, switch any two wires and it goes the other way. So they don't draw that on. Most motors, you will get some motors, usually on the tool you find at a bargain price that you go, this is awesome. Man. Uh, this, an auction the other day that Sold a really great saw stop. For, you know, I think it went for $700. I'm in good shape. Had a 460 single voltage motor on it. So if you don't have 460 at home and three phase, it's going to be more difficult. Most, most motors you run into are dual voltage. And they'll, they'll have, you can run this motor on 110, 115, 120, those are all the same. 220, 230, 240, well, it's high and low. And they will have a, they will show, okay, we have six wires in here, and if you're running it on 110, connect these to these, and these to these, and these to these. And if you're running it on 220, run these to these, these to these, these to these. If you, Get a motor that's, you, you plug it in and it's got the, 
you know, it's got a 110 plug on it. And you plug it in and it just, it just goes slow. And you got it from Handy Harry at his yard sale. And you're going, man, nah, that's just, I guess the motor's crap, but check and, check and see if maybe it's actually wired for 220. And in his garage, it was easier to run a 220 line and put just a regular 110 outlet and plug on the cord, and it ran fine. But it's, it's not going to run that way at your house unless you also wire it incorrectly. So check that. If you get it, um, generally new stuff, it, it tells you what it's wired for. It may say, but if you wanted to. Here's the wiring to change it to the other. But it's usually not a surprise. It's, it tells you it's 220 or tells you it's 110. Uh, nice thing about going to the higher voltage is your amperage draw is less per conductor. So instead of being 6 amps at 220 or at 110, it's 3 amps at 220. And if you're in the six to, you know, anything below 15 doesn't matter because you've got, you've got the, that's about the smallest breaker you're going to find in anything except the Brookside houses that have 15 amp service to the entire house and a water wheel and whatever down a stairway that's only this wide. I've been in those houses. I'm not picking on people. And internally to the motor, it makes no difference. It doesn't, if it's getting, if it's getting 220 in the proper 220 way, it doesn't have any more power than it has if it's getting 110 in the 110 way. It's just, you're making changes and it's how it feeds into the, into the field to get it right. Um, but when you get up higher, and now you're looking at, um, it's a five horse motor, and it's saying, well, okay, single phase, we can do that. It's 32, 32 amps, but 220, now we're down into, 20, hey, I could run that on wire, or I can run that on 12 gauge wire, okay, this is good. Or even I can run that on 10 gauge wire. But when you get up into the, there is no 32 amp breaker, so now you're at 40. If you're at 40, you're now at eight gauge. As wire size goes up, cost of wire goes up even faster. There is no cheap wire, but there is more expensive wire. And generally, if you can keep your wire cost down, that's why they run 460 in these uh, manufacturing plants, because they run a lot of wire. And 460, you can run, you know, 14 gauge and run a five horse motor. And it's pulling 10 amps, and it's a great thing. But if the motor doesn't have dual voltage, well, you're stuck. You got to either find a way to get. You know, we'll say you're at home and you have, you have 220 single phase available. And so you say, well, so that means I can't, use, I can't do three phase at all. No, that's not true. We can use uh, BFDs or a very popular name, variable frequency drive. And basically what it does is it electronically generates three-phase three phase looking power out of single phase. What it actually does is it creates pulses that vary as the sine wave goes. Um, and so by doing that, it can say, yeah, as far as the motor, they're, they're close enough together, the motor goes, uh, sure, yeah, that's probably. I have heard machinists say that 
um, VF, you know, VFD converting to three phase, they can see a difference in the finish because it's not as smooth as natural three phase. And, but if you're not John Van Gotham, what does it matter? I mean, we, we can't tell. The, uh, but that's, the, the FDs offer a lot of possibilities. One, they can, they can kick you up to three-phase power, so now you can run your three-phase table saw or drill press or whatever that you couldn't run before because you didn't have three-phase power. They also provide speed control, or can provide speed control. They can provide uh, slow, soft start. They can do soft, in, soft, soft stop so that you know, you're not hitting that switch and bam, everything gets that's ramming on and current in rush is huge. You can kind of ease into it. The, uh, I don't think they really do well on kicking up the voltage real high. So then you end up with if you having to get a transformer. And once you start getting transformers, the supply line is getting farther. Your, your savings are going away. And maybe you start looking at, well, maybe I replace that motor with a, with a single phase motor and we'll, we'll go that route. Um, another approach is using a rotary phase converter, which basically you have another three-phase motor and a control box that gets the, gets the three-phase motors rolling and kind of balances the legs. But as that motor runs, it's generating a much nicer, a prettier three-phase out of it. And you can use that to power your three-phase drill press or whatever. Nothing's free, so you're losing um, capacity. You can't, if you've got a five horsepower um, table saw that's three phase and you want to run that, you'll need a rotary phase converter that's at least seven and a half horsepower because it, it can't really, it's not creating extra power, it's just kind of redistributing it. And so, since it only has two of the three legs, it can't, it's down about a third. So you lose about a third. But up to a point, it works great until you find something really nice and really big. And now you need a 40 horse motor on your rotary phase converter. And its power draw causes you to A, get a Christmas card from Evergy, and then usually a uh, cease and desist letter from Evergy because they, they kind of plan on houses using only so much. And if you set up like an electric arc furnace or something, they, they get touchy. Um, there is a, a cheaper one that's just basically a capacitor that gets the three phase motor running on the single phase wire. And that, again, it's running at about two-thirds capacity, and it's, it's not really smooth, but depending on what you're running, it can be okay. Um, now, let me just say, if you know, anybody here happens to be a power transmission engineer, you know, I, I think your car is waiting for you out front. <laughs> yes, sir. When you're running a static phase converter, is that since you're only running two phases? There, whoa, 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 whoa. Or I should say one phase. How hard is that on your motor? Since it's 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 not that it's hard. It's that it's weak. Um, I mean, it's turning, and I mean, you can even go past the cheapest route is if you have a pulley on the motor or you're good with your foot, if you can get the motor spinning before you hit the power, once it's got a direct, remember that's what these capacitors are doing, 
is they're saying, here's the get started turning. You can get the motor spinning and then hit the power and it'll run. And your little static phase converter isn't really doing anything after that more than your feet was. Of course, you have to be able to get your feet under your table saw and get the, don't grab the blade and pull it. Right? <laughs> you didn't hear that here. Band saw, I guess you could do. But again, that would be wrong. Um, but you're still, you know, you're in that two-thirds and where you run into the issues are if you, if you bog it down, you're going to, it doesn't have as good a lope and it's going to start getting too far out of phase and then it can just stall and sit there and so generate. So theor theoretically it wouldn't affect the longevity of your motor? It shouldn't, no. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not the harshest part of it. It's just you have to be accepting that, well, I either have to have a bigger motor so that I can, or I have to do a lighter, subject the motor to less effort. And it doesn't work as well on high load uh, equipment, especially high startup load. Um, air compressors are one, anything with, if you have that, dandy 36 inch bandsaw and it's got to get that whole thing turning like that it can't it just doesn't have enough of that startup oomph torque to get it going um, and so then you then you're introducing heat um, and like i said heat is starting a motor is is, is hard work because nothing's moving and it's fighting it. And once it gets going, it's like, yeah, okay, all I need is a, you know, it's that like riding a bike. When you first, first get on and get going, you have to stand on the pedal. Um, I just wanted to throw in a comment. I've had some experience using inverters, mostly on air compressors, where you had a 15 or 20 horse motor and you didn't have three phase. And what I've run into is that you get an inverter that's rated for at least twice yeah. what the motor's rated for. Because while the inverter can put out enough juice to run the motor, it'll never start it. Yeah. So I've that's seen people try to start Rhodes three air compressors with inverters. And yeah, they, they, got, they think the right inverter, but it won't run. They can't ever get it going. That's it. And, it's that and, starting. And, I mean, if you, uh, put a, if you put an amp meter onto the coil of a motor that well, say this one that was in the dust collector for the bandsaw. And when I was talking to Oneida, I said, yeah, I put, I put the uh, amp meter on it and turned it on. It was pulling 78 amps. And on the faceplate, it should be in the... It should be pulling about 17. On 110, it should be pulling 32. And so we're doing double that. But that's only supposed to be for just, just a moment till it starts going. And that's really with nothing pulling on it. Well, if you take a compressor that doesn't know that you're starting up, and so it's going, starts moving, it's going, this is hard. And the motor is saying, this is hard. And you're not giving it much to get going. And the other, the other thing that I'd throw out is that the only, the, the, a reason to, to do an inverter is because single phase motors above about 10 horse are either non existent or astronomically expensive. Yeah. You just can't yeah. get them. Yeah, it, so. it runs into. After a while, I mean, I had a, I had a seven and a half horse, 110 volt motor that rode around in my van for a few years that uh, back in the back in the early days with rural electric um, they would run 110 to the farms and you, you know you used to not have anything so here you don't need more than this and they'd start getting as they got more and more mechanical instead of just a light bulb hanging there and start getting milking machines and all this other stuff. 
I need a big motor. Well, here you go. Well, we're not running new lines out here. We nailed them to trees. Um, and so this thing, I pulled 58 amps. That was its running amperage. And it's like, OK, there's, you're starting to get finger size wiring that you're, you're going to. Um, the getting the higher voltage helps. Getting the multi-phase really helps. Um, and the, uh, the inverters are, I mean, they're, they're really cool. They're small. They are much cheaper than they were. I mean, now uh, one horsepower is 100 bucks. Um, first one I bought was one and a half horse, and it was $2,500. And it didn't do anything fancier than what the little ones do, if that. But gave them 20 years to, to get it popular. Um, they, uh, there are some motors that, like I said, it, unless you, it's, there are shops. Let me shout out to Klimp Electric Motor over in KCK. They are, uh, they are great people. They will probably, any motor in here you took in and said, oh, I need you to rewind this. And they would probably say, I think that's a big mistake. I, I think you should find another solution. Let us sell you something else. But you could take your 460 volt motor in and say, I want you to rewind this for 230 volt single phase or three phase. And they could do it, but you would have to really, really want them to do it because it's going to cost, I think their break even point is, I think it's around 50 horsepower. And anything smaller than a 50 horsepower motor, it's it's just buy another motor, it's cheaper. Um, and if you go on YouTube and there are several showing how they rewind a motor and it's a, it's a job and they're able to stick both hands in. When you're doing a little, little motor like this, I mean, and you're trying to lay each of those coils in and It's taken too much time. They have to pay too much to staffing, and it's just not worth it. You come in with a $300 motor, $700 motor, and say, yeah, I need this rewound. They go, OK, $2,600, here you go. Uh, and you go, whoa, that's kind of more than the motor. And, yeah, did you not hear about the battery and the cordless drill? Um, you asked us to fix it. You didn't. But they, they, they will discourage you. They will say, oh, that's, that's not a good idea. You, you should just buy another one. And um, at that point, the, you know, generally repair is it's maintenance stuff. It's keeping it clean, yeah. replacing bearings when they're making noise. If it stops, um, you know, the, General, if it's the motor, if it doesn't turn, but it used to turn, uh, more than likely your start capacitor has gone out, and they're fifteen, twenty dollars, and you put one in, and hopefully it's all well and good. And usually it is. I mean, usually that's um, if that doesn't, or it does for a little while, which is what happened here. And it put, put a new one in, and it ran for about three minutes, and then started going slow. It's like, well, what's the next step? Centrifugal switch is out. New centrifugal switch, and new and another new start capacitor. And by then, it was too late. Chuck, we have some questions. Did I say I'm ready for questions? Now we're out of microphones. Did I say, <laughs> did I, I, say I was ready for questions? I have a question real quick. Variable frequency 
drive hooked up to a, a lathe that's got a pretty good size three phase motor on it. Uh -huh. You can control the speed on the lathe. Uh -huh. The power supposedly stays the same through the speed range. You don't, you just don't have the push. You're slowing yeah. down and you get, you get, I think it's, you get down to the lower 15%, then you start really, it'll turn. And depending on the load you're putting on it, you know, if it's a nice flat wheel, sure. If you've got sandpaper on that wheel and you're leaning into it, well, probably not. But, or you might get, you know, you can get enough inertia going that you can, here's the slow speed, but um, it's the same uh, with the drill presses, which are, think of them as a three-phase motor with a VFD on them. That they're not, they're, they're a reactance motor, but they define, but when you get down to the lower stuff, you don't really get to, they teach you that um, RPM and torque are a pair. And so if you lower the RPM, if your input power is the same, if you lower the RPM, you increase your torque. And likewise, when you raise your RPM, you lose torque. And that's how transmissions work. But there's a limit to that of how much you can say. Any other questions? Yo. Radial arm saw. When you turn it on, yeah. right here. when you turn it on, it starts up fine. Uh -huh. And then when you turn it off, as it winds down, it makes a ew. Make it sounds like it's laboring or something. What what's going on? Our radial alarm song, or yours? Mine. Oh, okay. Well, I, and I and I will explain why I asked that question later. But, um, and it's not the blade wine. It's more than likely the uh, centrifugal switch is going in. And it's the, the switch contacts rub on this phenolic plate. And so it could, it's just a little scrubbing. Hard to replace? Need to replace? Probably not. Um, hard to replace, depending on the radial arm saw. The reason I asked um, about if it was our radial arm saw, if you use our radial arm saw or our 16 inch joiner, you'll turn it off and it comes to a stop pretty quick, much quicker than if it didn't have what's called a short stop. And then you might hear a murk. And if you look at the real arms on the blade, it might be shaking a little. This box is. worse than mosquitoes. Um, what this box does, and this is the nice thing about three-phase motors is you can reverse them pretty much on the fly. And so if you, you see this in the old reel-to-reel -reel tape decks, and you run them up and instead of hitting stop, you hit reverse and it'll slow down and then back up. So we, we have these red boxes back there called short stops. And what they do is they back feed the motor with three phase going the other, the other direction. And that breaks the motor. And if the timing isn't, you know, it doesn't stop exactly at the same point, it's sending it a little, a little few seconds of extra turning, but not enough to turn it backwards. And so that's, why, and that's a noise that you hear here. And, shouldn't hear at home, but it makes the wind down from the joiner go from two and a half minutes to about 20 seconds. And the uh, radio alarm saw about the same. Um, but, so that, that's why now, but since we brought up radio alarm saws, I have one right here. These are, Basic motor. The only difference is, everybody can see, 
They're not round. And that was the cool thing they did, was getting this field to go all the way around, but not eat up extra space underneath it so that now I have to, I want a big motor, it's got to be this big around, and to get a depth of cut, I now have to have a blade this big. And so one of the cool things they did was get that fixed. Now, that's what makes it a specialty motor. That means that Klimp Electric might not throw you out when you say, well, I need you to fix this. They probably still will because they'd say, you know, unless that's the last one on earth, I still think you can get it cheaper if you buy three from eBay and two on Facebook Marketplace and two out of a van from a guy. I think uh, it's still, you got to really want it bad. Now, if it goes on the space shuttle, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they can do that. You're next. Before we get, before we get too far off of uh, the quick stop thing, is that wired inline plug quick stop is an external unit? It is an external okay. short stop. Short stop. That's, yeah, that's pretty Yeah, cool. no, it's, um, if you look, it's a little red box that's mounted back there. It's not like in the control box of the motor at all? No, it's, okay. it's on the machine. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, uh, of course, we get out of control, all that's, all that's on this, it, this is just a box with, for the wire connections. Um, then the, uh, there are two control boxes on the side of the cabinet that have that. Yes? The uh, motor qualified switch and the big capacitors, uh, where am I gonna find those? I suspect it won't be the big box stores. Um, Amazon, uh, Amazon, Grizzly, eBay. Um, Granger, any of the industrial supply houses. Um, I mean, they're all, they're a pretty generic point. It's, it's terminals at the top, terminals at the bottom. Pick the size that'll handle what your motor, they're, they're not really motor specific. So there, there is quite a range um, if, you, if you love um, Square D, they make them. If, if you love Allen Bradley, <laughs> you can find old ones. Um, but there's any industrial supply. And, and just out of curiosity, uh, what, how many microfarads or whatever would those capacitors be? Um, the start are, these are 280, these are, this is 200, the run are more like 40. And, and they, but it, go, it, it depends on the size of the motor. Regarding three phase available. Uh, a lot of places advertise generators in case of a power outage. What's the chance I could find a three-phase propane power generator? Well, there's one right outside. I don't know if it's propane, um, but it'll run the whole complex. They um, probably pretty high. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be unlikely to find them. Probably not the Generax at Home Depot because that's not the market. But all Generax, I'm sure they they can pull in three phase without too much trouble. It's just a different generator. It's, you're spinning. Whatever you're spinning, they're not. They're doing it. They're doing it power plant wide. You know, same way they do it at Wolf Creek, except without the nuclear, they're using propane. Uh, for this shop, uh, is there any equipment that, that is not three-phase? A lot of it. All the saw stops. Um, everything in this room except for the joiner is single-phase. 
um, in the back, the saw stops, the uh, small dust collectors, the small planer and joiner. Um, all of the band saws except the Powermatic. Um, and the miter saw. They're all single phase. No. I don't know if it's three phase. But it should be. Which, which tools are single and which are three phase? Panel saw. Was the panel saw three phase? Yes, Bill. You, uh, you started out talking about the DeWalt batteries, battery tools. Uh -huh. When it says direct drive motor on some of their drills, what exactly does that mean? Because when you use them, then they, they emit kind of an odor, which their other drills don't. And it's mostly their power heads that are that way. And then I've got a follow-up question to that. Um, this is the motor, this is the output, and it's pretty much just a straight line. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they would refer to it as direct drive, because they're pretty much all, they, they go into a gearbox that brings the optimum speed for the motor in line with the optimum speed for output. Um, they're getting, they're making the move away from brushed to brushless, which are, um, you know, that was, that was the big thing about Festool's drills long ago, was that they were brushless, and basically they have little, little like little free, three phase motors. And then the other question is, is there a way to take those DeWalt batteries and do something to them so that they completely discharge and then they'll hold a charge? better? On the is that a myth or is that really something? Um, on the NICAD batteries, you could, if you, you're trying to get them out of their um, memory, where they think that 50% charge is full charge. And yeah, if you charge them and bleed them down, put them to a light or something, bleed them down, charge them back up, you can get some of that back. Lithium ion, it's a more dangerous game. Um, if you get down below a certain point, the batteries won't charge. So you really don't want to run them dead dead. And, and the better, better batteries have circuitry that stops before you get to that point. But if you then leave it at that minimal charge level and go to Europe for a couple of years to backpack through and come back, that battery may not come back. Um, okay. Um, on the, the nice thing about the motors is you don't really have to guess. They will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. Um, they have a motor data plate if it's still on. If it's not, then welcome to the world of, ah, it seems like it should be okay. Uh, but they will have uh, key information, the volts it runs on, how many amps that's going to pull, uh, the RPM of the motor, Generally, we deal with either 3,600 or 1,800 RPM, which are more accurately 3,450 and 1,750 RPM. There are also 1,140 RPM motors, 900 RPM. It's all in how they, how they build the, the motor, how many poles the motor has. Um, they'll tell you the hertz whether it's single phase or three phase. 
Um, full load efficiency and power factor. And then I have a temperature rating. Uh, for instance, this one is 40, de 40 degrees C ambient continuous, which means I can put this probably up on the roof and it can run all day, all night, and it's going to stay within that 40 degrees without getting too hot. If you set it, if we go to Arizona and set it up on the roof, it's not going to last. It, it's going to exceed the, the heat it can handle and it will barbecue grill like that one. Um, continuous. That means you can run it for more than a short period of time. Um, air compressor needs to be able to run until it gets up to its shutoff pressure. Um, that may take longer than others, but it's under load the whole time. Some motors are meant for just long enough to get your car window up. You can't sit there and put it under that load for half an hour. And so that'll be intermediate. Um, this one has the low voltage and high voltage connections printed on it. Sometimes they're here, sometimes they're in the junction box. Usually they're written down somewhere. Um, it's all pretty much the same, especially on the three phase. They tend to, they have nine wires instead of six, so you're grouping them differently. Uh, they'll have the frame number for a NEMA motor, National Electric Manufacturing, whatever. It's a standard, and it will describe the external dimensions of the motor. It'll tell you how big the shaft is, how long the shaft is, how, what kind of face mounting is on it, where the feet are, how far it is from the feet to the center of the shaft, um, how long the motor is, everything you need to know so that you know that if I burned up this one and I need another one, if I get the same frame that it will fit in what I took out. Be aware there are NEMA and there is metric and they're different and you won't be able to they don't interchange too well. Mainly the shafts are metric and that's your first stumbling block. Everything else you could shim up but it's, it's much easier just to match to the motor. Um, what else can they tell us? Some will go into more detail. Um, they'll tell you how often you can start. That gets back to motors don't like heat. Starting a motor is a lot of heat why it's, it's, it's good that everyone turns on the dust collector before they use the tool and turn it off when they're done. Not so good if you're at the joiner, you turn it on, two passes on the joiner, turn it off, walk over to the planer, turn it back on, and these things are usually they're looking at like six times an hour. That's how often they want to go through that startup in rush current. We go way past that. We, we, we're probably doing, on a bad day, 20, 30 an hour. Um, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna be using it for a while, intermittent, leave it on. And when the foreman looks at you with that stink eye of, Steve, we, did you forget to turn it off? He's coming right back. No, just leave it on. It's a, 
It's, it's better to turn it on than to not turn it on because you only need it for a minute, but if you can leave it on as you jump from station to station, that, that's always better for them. Unfortunately for power tools, you need to turn them off when you walk away. Don't. Yeah, I know the logic sounds like, well, I'll be right back. I'll just leave the table side. I'll come back. Because you're not at home alone, turn it off. I mean, if you're, if you're at home, there's a lot of rules you can break. Um, if, you're, if you set up a three phase and you have your rotary phase converter running and you've wired your shop to run multiple tools, if you're having trouble, if you have a tool that's kind of trouble to start, you can turn on some more tools and it will give you, they all start acting like little rotary phase converters and they can help that troublesome motor get started. But it does mean that you have other tools running at the same time and much better for a single use, single user shop than a community shop like ours. Um, that's really all I can think of. If anyone but Norm has a question, <laughs> I, I think that would work. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> I got a, a half horse motor off a jointer I took apart and put back together because it was crap, cram full of dirt. And now it runs, but it pulls about twice the nameplate amps. Got any idea what to look for? Um, I don't know if you got it all cleaned out and the bearings are, Pardon? are the bearings good? Yeah, the bearings are good. It runs nice and smooth. I wondered if I screwed up the, the switch that kicks out the starting winding. If your starting winding stayed in line, would that run the amps up? or? Does that make any Not sense? Not so long. Um, I mean, it'll, they'll burn out fairly quickly. Um, well, I don't run very long just to see that it ain't right. I would probably look more to make sure that it's still, still wired to the 110 or, because yeah. I, I did that on my little DeWalt radial arm, so I'm like, man, this, oh. No, I guess that's why. All right. Well, anyway, I found another motor, but I've, I've still got that one, so. Brushless, the new uh -huh. tools with brushless motors, uh -huh. will they last as long as a motor without brushes? Oh, yeah, probably longer. How do, how do they work? Are they based on like a, a capacitor type like start? These. No, because remember they're D they're DC. Okay. So they can they've got they've got magnets and they can say go, and they've got electronics that I mean I think I mean I think this little module here is like eighty five dollars at e replacement parts and it does all of the thinking. So it's kind of a specialty VFD kind of thing. So it's could, could you could you address what you would look at specifically on your data plate to match if you're replacing a motor on your drill or on your router or whatever? What are the pieces of data that you're like, I gotta hit this exactly for what I had previously? Um, well, for for drills and routers, you're you're stuck to manufacturer. And so it's model number. Um, I need the replacement parts for this um, quarter cable um, 7900 7, router. And you have one choice. You don't get to go out to the open market like you do with the other stuff. Um, some of them, the you would run into the problem, uh, the old Unisaws had a great part number that almost lined up except the last two letters were SP. And they have a nice bracket welded onto the outside of the motor. And that means that instead of being able to get the motor anywhere, you could get it from Rockwell Delta and at a at bargain 
premium price. I will say, bigger motors have lifting eyes on them, or a space for lifting eyes. That's for the motor, not, not for everything that the motor's connected to. Just, um. All right, Norm, how can I help you? You said maintenance was one of the things that, to do about motor maintenance was cleaning the motor. What does that entail? You're not talking like spick and span in a toilet brush, right? No, no. Um, and on the totally enclosed motors, there's, there's, uh, it's designed not to have that problem. But for the open drip proof that are bringing the air in through the and it flows right through the armature. In a woodworking environment, those will fill up. And if they don't believe in dust collection, when you fill up the whole cabinet of the saw, you don't get much circulation through, but you've got dust. And so cleaning them out, it's more it's more of a problem that you'll clog up the centrifugal switch and it will either jam in the closed position so it stays on where it can't open up enough to disconnect or it stays in the disconnect and then it won't start. And, um, but it's, it's kind of, you know, air nozzle Give it a blow. It's something with the same with the uh, you know the hand tools. Um, remember that, and this goes a lot for the palm sanders. With the air, you can get those uh, sanders moving a whole lot faster than they ever thought they were ever going to go. And they, when they design them, they kind of think of well, how fast is this going to go? And if they're thinking, well, full out 500 RPM, and you hit it with air up to 20,000, then things may not hold up all that well. So, but usually, you know, just blowing out the chips, unless it's, unless you get grandpa's saw, or the one from the railroad that uh, Ron Ha went down to in Chama and found that it was Pretty much the inside of the saw was a solid block of sawdust, packed tight, and then you might need to go a little further to make sure you got the stuff out. But um, for the most part, maintenance is listening, bearings, keeping, uh, keeping things tight, um, keeping belts properly tensioned. Which one? <laughs> the one that was black on the inside oh, yeah. that you had. So I assume that didn't happen instantaneously. It happened over time. Yes. And maybe you noticed the smell of burning sawdust on it, or maybe you reached down and felt it and it was hot. If you do that, outside of looking for a replacement motor because you know it's going to die soon, what would you do? Um, well, this is off of the airlock on the dust collector and found that it would, uh, it would jam up mm -hmm. and basically lock it. And so it's, it's running off of a VFD that, and it was just sat there and slowly cooked. And we got away with it several times. Um, and several people had got burned Oh, that, that feels hot. Whoa. Just like the stove. I, remember, I hear my mother. And finally, it you know, went full charcoal and stopped turning. Okay. And then, if I had, like Joe, an older lathe that uh -huh. has step pulleys on it, uh -huh. and I want to actually convert it to variable speed, are we talking DC motor instead of an AC motor? 
I wouldn't. Um, I mean, there are, there are 90 volt and 180 volt permanent magnet motors. Your selection is less, um, but they have variable speed controllers and they, they work fine. Um, it's just finding your, your choices versus pick the, the three phase base mount motor you, with, that you like and wire it up with the VFD and then go to town. Okay, thanks. So this has me thinking about all the different noises I've heard motors make as I turn it on. Is there a particular noise that you hear that shows to a certain symptom either on the beginning of a start of a tool or on like once it turns off? That means like a specific thing, like either the brushes went out or... Uh... Uh, yeah, the worst. right, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like one that like I turn on, there's a delay, uh, boom, then it goes, you know? Um, well, first brushes, if, if the brush is bad, it won't, generally won't, won't turn go. on at all, right? You might, yeah. you might start getting that little, uh, acrid smell. Um, the brush is already, already burned up, so it's not really, I mean, the nice thing is they do tend to act as the fuse and be what goes bad, uh, as long as they don't get too, too terribly worn. Um, generally, it's it's not so much sounds; it's it's ac it's the action. If they're if they're slow to start, uh, if they're squeaking, you know, the bearings are generally the problem. Um, there's they shouldn't make a lot of noise, but if you start slow to start, is a good indicator that something's not quite right, and especially if it's I mean, some things are slow to start. Some things, um, one of these, I think the Tarmatic, the black planer in there, the belts have a set to them. And so when you turn it on, it goes bam, you know, and you go, oh, it's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's a little shock in that belt. It's, it's not the motor per se, it's just moving the slack out. That's the way we fix TVs in the 50s. Depending. Verticals here. What? Is that a viewing on. port on the... And if so, what is being viewed? Um, help me out. Here? Yeah, what? I don't know what you're talking about, Greg. But it looks like a viewing port. Oh, this? Yeah. Well, this is the... Th this sits here. And then there's a box that goes over it. Where's that shiny metal? That's a shiny metal. That's, oh, they didn't, I they've, was, I thought it was a plastic. They painted after they put it all together. And so that's what it looks like before they paint it. In the back. I don't have a microphone. It's coming. Occasionally. Time's up, I'm sorry. Next. <laughs> Occasionally, I'll see like an old direct drive planer or joiner. Uh huh. Should those just be avoided? Are the motors standard? Not if they work. No, the motors are not standard at all. Um, is the cutter head and the motor actually one thing? On some of them. Um, the uh, the direct drive. Playing the theremin, um, the uh, the direct direct drive have advantages. Um, I have a Northfield table saw that's direct drive. Downside is because the whole motor's there on the arbor that the blade attaches to. Uh, you start at a 16-inch blade. It'll take a 16 up to a 22-inch blade to get depth of cut. Um, but it's all one piece. Um, joiners, very often it's all one piece. You haven't. Um, the planers, usually they're all one piece. Though they did start, there are some, at least I think of the Powermatic 25, 24 inch 
that there is there is a junction and the motor connects to the rest of the shaft. But it's it's as long as it works, it's a great, you know, you, you remove all that linkage, it's direct drive, it just goes. And when you take it now, you're looking at something that going to the, to the motor shop and saying, yeah, this one's probably worth having you fix. Um, and they... So generally they run smoother, you would say? Well, they run smoother because you don't have... Uh, the pulleys. The pulleys in the, the belt and... Um, you know, the motor, the motor is taking the drag directly. You don't, you're not getting slip. Um, depending on, you know, if they do, do a good job. Um, I know Northfield redoes theirs when they get the motors in because they don't think the motor manufacturer balances them well enough. But, you know, you're talking, you're talking not cheap stuff. I mean, my, my Northfield now sells for around $12,000 new. Mine's a 54 model, so uh, it was less. But, you know, you're, 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 you're spending money for it. And so you tend to get, you know, you're not going to find a Craftsman direct drive unit um, where it's built on the Arbor. one. Uh, I paid for two. Uh, earlier, you, I believe you said that the motors on the bench then are going out to be recycled. So the motor that I have at home that whistles when it works is hotter than hell and screeches uh, quite a bit. I can just bring that on in here and you'll, you'll take that to the recycle place with all the rest of yours. Well, I would think that it'd be easier if you came in and took all of these <laughs> with you. Oops. And that would save you having to haul your motor in. Could, could I, I guess I couldn't bring mine in and just swap it out for one of the ones here in the machines, right? Second question I had was, is, uh, you may have answered it before, but I wasn't paying attention. No. I've got, I've got some battery-operated, cheapo tools at home. I want to know how I'm going to recharge that. I know that there's not, it's not the way to have them hooked on the charger 24 hours a day, 52 weeks of the year for that 10 minutes that I'm going to use it for Christmas toys. But what's your recommendation on that? Is, is this something I should... When I've used it, recharge it. When it says green, pull it out of the charger, set it off to the side and say, try to plan this so an hour before you use it, check to see if the charge is there. If, you, uh, if you're using them regularly, yeah, pull it charge. If you're not, if you're going to use them eventually, Around, uh, around an 80% charge, keeps the battery happy, doesn't upset the higher end. And hopefully you don't get a lithium fire because those are real hard to put out. That's why I have insurance. Oh, oh, I see. Insurance. Are there any uh, notoriously bad tools as far as like, direct drive motors and stuff that like people should stray away from? Um, so this is where we get into the uh, the slander part of the show. How about it? Well, you know. Before I give my recommendations, you'll need my name. It's Ezekiel Hezekiah. And I'm not from around here, so <laughs> I live in a van down by the river. Um, cheap tools have cheap motors. Um, 
generally, Chinese motors are nothing to write home about. Home, home about. Um, Taiwanese motors seem to hold up better. Um, a lot of it you get what you pay for. Um, that being said, pay for what you need. Uh, you and NASA don't need to shop at the same stores um, because you can service yours without having to leave the planet. So, you know, there's, you can save something there. Um, generally, motors Motors last longer the more they're used within the range of operations they're designed for. Um, if you lean on it, you're, you're making it work harder. And the harder it works, the shorter it lives. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.